Well, we are still in the book of uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, and uh, I was uh, examining a few verses and extracting some thoughts to parallel this particular portion of Scripture with the growth of the season of the apostolic uh, within our own uh, South African context and how it has evolved into something that is now affecting uh, several parts of the world. And <clears throat> as Thamo mentioned, uh, you can even see it in the life of David, and I know that he will expand more on that in the sessions that he has. Uh, but we shared how uh, God spoke to Ezekiel, and how Ezekiel was asked if these bones can live, as uh, Peter just mentioned. And he said to him, prophesy to these bones and say to them, hear the word of the Lord. And one of the, one of the things that has taken place is that the multitudes are pressing in to hear the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 5 will tell you that when Jesus was on the lake of Gennesaret with these two boats that were there, he got into the boat of Peter, and Peter means the intelligent hearer. And as he was standing in this boat, the multitudes pressed in to hear the word of the Lord. The word press is a powerful word because it means to measure oneself upon another. So the word becomes a measuring tool by which we become uh, measured. And the one who speaks is actually measuring you according to Jesus Christ who is the perfect, uh, the perfect son. It's like... Uh, how Elisha lay upon the sun and measured himself hand to hand, mouth to mouth, feet to feet. The same that Paul did when he was uh, <clears throat> sitting in the house and one of the young men whose name was Eutychus fell to the ground from the third floor and he died, but he measured himself upon him and he brought life to him. So when you are hearing the word of the Lord, the word is being measured upon you to bring life to those parts that are dead so that you can live. Everyone say live. So this is what Ezekiel is experiencing when God said to him, prophesy to these bones, say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the law. And that's why we come to these sessions and uh, these, uh, these seminars, conferences, schools, forums, tables that have been existing for a long period of time, dialogues, uh, has caused the word of the Lord to be sounded out, the frequency, as I mentioned in the previous session, uh, that has been released, and people began to really press in. We see a deep hunger uh, for people wanting to listen to God's word like never before. People used to come to see signs and wonders and miracles, but I think the greatest sign is that people can sit on an afternoon on Friday at 3 o'clock, and still hear the word of the Lord after going through three grueling sessions already, passing through lunch, uh, and still surviving to hear the word of the Lord. It's a captivating culture, uh, something that draws people to continue, even though sometimes you are continuing through your sleep, but you are still hearing the word of the Lord. <laughs> but there's something about it where you want to hear the word of the Lord. And verse, verse number Seven is what we were concentrating on as uh, Ezekiel was, was obedient to begin to prophesy as the Lord commanded him. And I shared how God raises up angels that come to prophesy, to speak, to create a sound. And there was a noise. Another word for noise or sound or voice is a good word. It's called acoustics. Uh, it's very important to know that when a sound is released, it is released in the context of acoustics. Now, when Jesus was on the cross, uh, he shouted with a loud voice unto the Father. A sound was released, and it emanated from the Son of God. When that sound was released, everything began to shake, and the Bible says he yielded his spirit to the Father. So, the sound comes from a spirit that is yielded to God the Father. Uh, and when that sound comes, everything on the earth begins to quake. Everything on the earth begins to shake. And the graves were open, as you know. Certain things begin to happen. That which was dead starts coming alive. But more importantly, the political ruling 
uh, nation at that time, which was the Roman army, had soldiers there. And when the soldiers saw what was happening uh, at that moment when Jesus had released that sound, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. So when a sound is, uh, is produced and is released into the atmosphere, one of the things that it will begin to highlight is the difference between the true and the false. Even in the context of sonship, there's a true son that will begin to rise because of a yielded spirit to the Father, and everything around them begins to shake. When Paul and Silas were in prison and they began to sing hymns and they began to praise the Lord, uh, you know that the very prison that they were in began to shake because of uh, two brothers that were in unison with each other, two brothers that would, had one heart, as Tamu mentioned, and as they were in agreement with, with each other, uh, that sound began to shake the very prison doors. And you know that the jailer said, tell me what I must do to be saved. It is because of a sound that is pure, that is being released into the atmosphere. It carries a certain acoustic, carries something that is so, uh, that is so unique that begins to draw people into the kingdom of God. So there was a noise, and then I spoke to you about the rattling, and the rattling is about how everything starts to shake. It causes earthquakes, it causes vibrations, uh, different doctrines begin to clash, belief systems begin to clash, uh, all kinds of things begin to take place, and every foundation that you build upon starts getting tested. So once you perceive the sound, once you begin to uh, pick up its frequency, as mentioned, once you begin to uh, let the sound become a reality to you, everything around you begins to rattle and it begins to shake because everything that you've built, built on gets tested as the sound goes out. You know that when a sound is released, things begin to rattle. Now, I live in a township, so, so to speak, and uh, we have taxis. And when a taxi goes past, it, tech, it tests how good my aluminum windows are in my house, whether it can handle the rattling of that particular taxi that goes past with its big sound system. So don't think that because we say it's a still small voice, uh, that it's not, it doesn't have a context of where it can shake everything. Know that the sound is so powerful that it will shake everything around you, causing a deep rattling. Now, the next part of the verse says in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse number 7, it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a, a rattling. And the next part says, And the bones came together. So, once the sound is perceived and the rattling takes place and all the shaking takes place and all the, thing, all the earthquake, uh, all the things that you go through begin to, be, to get tested, you find that bones begin to come together. Now at this point, the bones are not joined, but they are simply coming, they are simply coming together. So what is, the, what is the purpose of the sound as it goes out? It begins to address every inaccurate structure. It begins to test the foundation of what you are building. And its other purpose is to cause you to come together. So we are different bones that make up this body called the body of Christ. And uh, we come together because we have perceived the sound. I'm sure many of us represented here yeah, from different churches, different networks, uh, etc. But the sound causes us to come together. But we may, not be, uh, we may not be joined at this time, but it is in that coming together that you actually begin to discover who you are really joined to. So in the immediate, in the immediate hearing of the sound and the coming together, you may not really know where you belong, and that may take a period of time. When I say belong, I'm talking about, uh, talking about the spiritual family that you feel connected to, sometimes the father that you feel connected to. But you, but you heard the sound. And uh, you felt the rattling of the sound. Yeah. And in that rattling, you came together. So the sound or the purpose of that voice going out or that noise releasing that sound is to cause us to come together. Even when uh, the sound that Gideon made when he went out, when he spoke, 
uh, even to the nation of Israel, many of them came together, 32,000 of them that came together, but they had to go through the tests to prove who was really joined to one another. And uh, the first test they faced was the fear test, as you all know. And uh, Randolph so wonderfully explained to us the origin of fear in the initial stages is because, they, because Adam lost his image, the fear came into him. And those that uh, responded to Gideon's call, which was a large number uh, that came in, they, 32,000 of them. But the first test, he says, all those who fear... Uh, you must go back to your, to your house. And you know, a large number of them left, 22,000 of them left, and only 10,000 were left behind because they, they were fearful about going into this battle. And where did that fear come from? It was a fear of working together with their other brothers to actually go into this battle and win and beat and, and uh, take the territory back from the Midianites. And the Midianites' spirit is a spirit of contention and strife. Actually, the word Midian means contention and strife. So when you're looking at the Midianite spirit, which is a spirit of contention and strife that causes you to be impoverished, and it causes you to have a weak mentality, even that Gideon had, that even though the angel said to him, you are a mighty man of valor, he saw himself as the least in his father's house, simply because fear was instilled in him. But when the the sound was, was gone out and the call was gone out and the angel came and reassured him that you are a mighty man of valor and that God has called you and Gideon began to respond to what the angel said. He had to deal firstly, how many of you know he went through the rattling? He had to deal with the altars in his father's house and he had to drop down the altar of Baal. He had to adjust structures, he had to adjust orders that were already established in his family, families that were worshipping on the altar of Baal. He had to break those structures, and that was a rattling. Because when he came, when he destroyed the, that altar, everyone was there in the morning, and they wanted to know who broke down this altar. And do you know, sometimes in your own journey in your church, when you respond to, the, to certain things that God is saying, and you break down certain altars that you have built, which we call operating systems, sacrificial systems, and the sacrifices you have made. You build altars because you put sacrifices on them. And the sacrifices that you make, and suddenly when you perceive a sound, you have to destroy all those things that you sacrifice so much for in your life. Something that you built for such a long time, you have to now destroy it. And that's, that's when the rattling part starts taking place. And uh, everyone wanted to figure out who was Jerubal that has broken down this altar? And they eventually figured it out. It was Gideon. And the very one that perceived the sound actually became a fugitive in his own family because everyone was seeking out the one who had broken down this altar. When you're dealing with altars and operating systems, because altars are connecting points. They are points where you connect and communicate with God. But when God brings revelation of things, he, he changes the way in which you connect with Him. He changes the way in which you see Him, in the way in which you begin to worship Him, and the way in which you perceive Him. But you've built an altar and you feel that this is the only way that you, that you do it. And therefore, altars have to be, under an Elijah anointing, reconstructed. They have to be reconstituted. You have to dig a trench around it. You have to make sure it has... 12 stones. You have to make sure that the water that is measured in that trench has seed capacity, not liter capacity. All of those things are about rebuilding the right way before you put the sacrifice back on. That's the rattling part. Say amen. amen. I'm just checking if you're awake. <laughs> so, it is so important to see in Gideon's life that before the coming together took place, there were things that had to be adjusted. And when that took place, even though the 32,000 responded, the fear was still there because of the strife and contention that a Midianite spirit instilled into the camp. They had a mentality of poverty, a mentality of being economically, excuse me, oppressed. This is during the time of judges. There were no fathers, by the way. Because during this time there was such oppression that was taking place by the spirit of Midian, the people were in this kind of mentality and therefore, even though they came together, they could not continue with Gideon because they were fearful. So, in your journey, 
people will enjoy the initial sound, but when they realize the reality of what it demands from them, they fail. When they realize this is what it's going to take to build this way, when they realize that this is the seriousness of what God is releasing to His church, and this is what it demands of us, this is what it demands of me in the context of sonship, this is what it demands of me in terms of working with my brother. This is what it demands of me to, to conform to what God is saying and doing right now. The fear test comes. And in that fear test, many will leave. 32,000 would dwindle down to 10,000. And then the 10,000 had to go through the next test, which is the water test. And the water test is the doctrine. Because they all had to come and drink of the water. And this water that was placed where they had to drink, they had to drink it in a certain way. And God said to them, take them to the water, let them drink. And some were drinking water, <coughs> excuse me, by taking it from their, from their, cupping it in their hands and bringing it to their mouth. But others were lapping it like a dog. And the dog is a symbol of a religious spirit. One that was bowing down, they were bowing down on their knees and, and uh, kneeling before the water and lapping it. And they were lapping it in a very religious position. And God said to Gideon, take only the ones that wanted to bring the word into their mouth. The water is a picture of God's word because God cleanses his church by the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5 verse 25 and 26. So that water was a picture of God's word. And you know that of the 10,000, only 300 remained because of the doctrine test. So when you bring people to the water before they come together. So can you see a lot will come together? You get, you get a large people that come together, 32,000. But as they start going through the test and the seriousness of the sound they perceive, fear grips them and then the water test begins to also grip them because doctrine is going to test what you're really made of. And when I say doctrine, I'm talking about Apostles' doctrine, doctrine that brings Christ into the church. One of the things that the church is lacking is the ability and the love for the doctrine of God's Word. That means teachings that people have to process. Some of it even fundamental teachings. For instance, if you're listening to Tamo, he is, he is bashing your soteriology, which is your, called your salvation. Why are you really saved? What did you get saved for? And the, the saving grace is for God to bring you into His image and His likeness that He wants you to represent Him as the sons of God because that's how salvation will come to the earth, by the manifestation of the sons of God. It's a redefinition of salvation. That's doctrine. So when you face that kind of doctrine, it's your test. It's your test. And at that test of 10,000, and 10,000 is also a picture of the law, it's the number 10, you've got to know that when you fail, when you go to that test, you're only going to have 300 with you. And 300 is a picture of oneness. The ark was 300 cubits long. It was Noah's ark. The shields in the house of, of uh, when King Solomon made the shields, the fighting shields that were all made of a special... Uh, material and they were all gold. There were only 300 shields, uh, shields that were, were made and they all symbolized oneness. The, the fragrant oil that the lady poured on the head of Jesus was worth 300 denarii. All of it is a symbol of a company of people that represent oneness. I'll explain to you why just now. But understand that doctrine brings people into the same mind. They have the same faith, the same love, the same spirit. Doctrine has the ability for all of us to say and believe the same thing. Amen? Yeah. Amen? So that's a test that you're really going to go through when you face this, uh, this process of getting the bones together. And then you really know what you got. Many churches that you go to, the prayer meeting is filled on a Tuesday night because we're praying for all our needs, but the Bible study is absolutely empty because no one wants to learn how to get their own needs solved. It's called self-deliverance. How do you do that? You learn the Word of God. 
You study the Word of God. Therefore, you find that Bible schools are all closing down because no one wants to study. Do you know that the younger generation never wants to enter in the, into the ministry anymore? There's no urgency for them to come into the ministry. Most of the so-called mainstream churches, like we call Presbyterian or Methodist or some of the other mainline churches that we know, one of their crises is they don't have pastors anymore. There's no young pastors entering the ministry. Why? There is no love for God's Word anymore. The fire for God's Word is not there. People don't love it. This is the test that the church will go through, that the sound that God has produced now is a love for His Word. Say amen. A love for doctrine. A love to, to get into God's Word. So, this test is a very serious test because it's going to show you who the 300 are. It's going to show you who are the ones that are going to work together, be, in one, be of one heart and of one mind and of one spirit. And that's what Gideon needed to overcome the Midianites. He needed a people that would be one in their belief system, one in their thoughts, one in their heart. And this happens because of the water test, the doctrine the test of doctrine, the test of loving the Word of God. So, today we have people that are more interested in the entertainment of church rather than receiving God's Word that can develop them. They are interested in the inspiration of God's Word and not its, not its ability to impart life into us. So, we, want, we have more inspirational preachers than impartational preachers. Because the imparting of God's Word begins to release life into you. We live more by impressing people rather than by expressing the image of God. This is the difference when doctrine becomes available to you. Because doctrine starts to form the image that is necessary to be expressed. So you're not here to impress anyone. You are here only to express what you already are. And that is, you are in the image and the likeness of God because you are His offspring. But to know what that image is, you have to go back to the Word to discover that, let it become internalized and express it. But you need doctrine for that. You need the Word of God. So, when Gideon brought them to the water test, many of them failed and only 300 was left. And that 300 had to go through the test of following the instruction of Gideon. They had to be able to do exactly what he did. So he gave them a torch, he gave them a, a vessel that they had to put the torch into, he gave them a sword, and he gave them a trumpet. And they all had to blow the trumpet together, they all had to break the vessel together, they all had to let the shine, let the light in the vessel, let it all shine together. And this is what brought confusion into the camp of the Midianites, because they all did it together. Say amen. Now, if you can get 10 people to do that, you've got a strong church. If you've got a company of people that can follow instructions and that become broken vessels that allow the light in them who is Christ himself to emanate from them and that have the sword in their hand and they have the trumpet and they all blow it together, that means they are making the same sound. When you do that, you can confront any principality within that region and it will fall Simply because we are in oneness. Simply because we are all doing it together. Amen? Simply because we are, in, we are in one mind, one heart, one spirit, one faith, and you know that you are one body. So, this is what coming together is. Now, when they came together, the next part of the verse says, they came, the bones came together, and then it says, Bone to bone. Bone to bone. Everyone say joint. joint. For a bone to be bone or joined to another bone, it has to have a, it has to have a, a joint. I know some of your joints are not working. As you get older, they need to be oiled. They need to be... So certain joints in your body don't work anymore. But the next part of it is that the joints... Uh, begin to, or rather the bones, begin to find their joint. Do you know that you can exist 
as someone in the church for a long period of time and not have a joint. You're just a bone. But you don't have a joint. That's why you don't have any momentum and mobility. That's why you don't have any forward momentum in life. That's why you find that your life is not finding its true purpose. Hello? Why? You don't have a, you don't have a joint. You don't have a solid connection in the spirit. You don't have something that you are deeply connected to. To give you that mobility. So coming together is not the be all and end all of everything. It's also about finding your joint. So as the season progressed, people perceived the sound. They went through the rattling and they came together. But it was after a period of time they discovered their joint. They discovered, who am I really connected to? What am I really joined to? So, we are joined to the Lord. We are co-heirs with the Lord. And uh, while we are joined to the Lord, the Lord also has a joint for us on the earth. So, in, in your journey... You may come together, but not discover your joint. So, it is important to know that bone-to-bone connection is a serious structural adjustment that we have to make in the spirit to know whom we are connected to, not what we are connected to. So, lots of us are connected to the what of Lighthouse, but we're not connected to the who of Lighthouse as a church. It is so important in your journey to know that the nation of Israel came to David at Hebron. They did not come to Hebron where David was. There's a difference. You can come to the house like the elder son, or you can come to the father of the house like the younger son. Because all that the house represents is in the father. Every resource and Uh, that is available within the house is connected to the father. So even the fatted calf of the house is connected to the father. He determines who that calf will be slain for because it's a resource within his sphere. And when, when the son, the younger son discovered what he had done or he came to his senses as it were, he said, I have sinned against my father and I've also sinned against heaven Realizing that by sinning against my father, against, I sinned against everything he represents. Yeah, 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 yeah. So everything that is resourced in the house comes from who the father is. So when you sin against the father, you are sinning against what he represents. And in this case, the elder son came to the house. He did not come to the father of the house, yeah. but he was coming together. In your journey, you come together as bones, but you must discover your joint. We call that covenantal relationships. Are we together? Are we together? (laughs) And it is so important to discover your joint. Say joint. Let me just spend a few minutes on this. Because in life, don't be a bone just lying around. Because I'll tell you what will happen. A dog will find you. (laughs) And dog is a picture of a religious spirit. As Pharisees were called dogs by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You must know that if you're just a bone lying around, the system of religion will take a hold of you and you'll just be a bone buried in the sand for some other dog to find. You will remain hidden in the recesses of this earth and be confined to its systems and its order and you will live off the system of this earth because you don't have a joint. All you'll do is dig in the ground and hide your bone in new places. They'll hide you in new places all the time. That's what a religious system does with a bone. Puts it in new places all the time. Just move you from one ministry to the next, to the next, to the next. But you've got no joint with anything. So you're just a good servant, but you're a dog. (laughs) Under a dog, or rather, under the control of a dog. So know that you can't be a bone just lying anywhere. 
Amen? You have to be joined to something. You have to be connected to something. And there are many examples of, of these in the Bible, but that's not the main subject. But bone-to-bone connections, there's a shift in emphasis from associations to covenant. Amen. It's a word that is very used very and brandished all the time, but it is a word that is very serious in the kingdom of God. It has to be recaptured in its meaning and it has to be emphasized again because it carries deep, deep meaning so that we understand that when we enter covenantal relationships which are very, very serious, when you violate them through the sins of bypass, surpass, and trespass, you bring lots of things into your life without knowing it. You invite things into your life. You open doors and you create opportunities for demons to visit you because you violate the principles of covenant. God does not do anything outside the framework of a covenant. He functions within the context of covenant. So when we're talking about a joint, we're talking about something that you are covenantally joined to. The emphasis of the sound that went out caused a rattling, caused a shaking, caused the bone to hear the sound, brought the bones together, but is emphasizing to the bone, you can't just exist, you have to be connected to something. You have to be joined to something. So there are many connections you would read of in the Bible. When I say connections, I'm talking about things that you have to, or people that you have to be joined to. People are happy to join institutions and organizations, etc., that represent something, but they are not happy to connect to people. When Ruth was a Moabite, a person who was fatherless, a person who was a foreigner, a person who had no rights within the context of a Jewish culture, she was married to a Jew in the form of uh, the son of Elimelech. And Elimelech moved out of Bethlehem. He came into Moab because of a famine that was taking place in Bethlehem, Judah. In fact, it was a father that migrated to an inaccurate location and the patriarchal grace upon his family was all totally beheaded. He died, his sons died, so there was no lineage, there was no longevity, there was no passing of transgenerational blessings because he lived in a location called fatherlessness. The place of Moab or the Moabitic uh, nation which originates, <clears throat> excuse me, tells you that this was, this was a place where there was no father because Moab means what father? One of the things that is being challenged globally is the grace of the patriarch. It is, there is a spirit that is totally against patriarchy. There's a spirit that is wanting to assassinate the, the, the grace that is upon a patriarch to pass down from generation to generation. That's why you will see a reduction in the growth and the fertility rate over the next couple of years because of the assassination of patriarchy. But Elimelech went into this place and because he went there, he destroyed his family lineage. When you choose to live within the context of remaining fatherless, you will have no genealogy. You will have no lineage, you will have no longevity, you will have nothing to pass down. The success of who you are is by what you're going to leave behind in terms of those that come after you. What values would you leave to them? What, what doctrine would you leave to them? What ways would you leave to them? David left a lineage where several kings were not even part of his lineage, not part of his family. They followed the ways of David. And by that he left a lineage in the ways that he, he, he practiced. They practiced his ways. Many of the reformers like Josiah, like Jehoshaphat, like Hezekiah, they followed the ways of David. But they were not within David's lineage. Are you listening? The ways are something that gets passed down. Now, Elimelech, when he moved into this place called Moab, where there was a fatherless spirit upon that region, you cannot pass your ways down. That means you're going to have a generation 
that does not have the faith like Timothy had because it was passed from his grandmother to his mother to him. The faith that was in you, the faith that is in you, that was in your mother and your grandmother was passed down. Like we see even in this church from Pastor Walter to his son and to, to David and to others that are down, the son of Peter. We have to have a faith that can pass down like that. It's not possible without patriarchy. The restoration of the grace of Father that begins to connect us in the spirit to what God wants us truly to be. So, this is what happens. And when they come into this region, Ruth marries one of the sons of uh, Elimelech, and both of them die. And we all know that Naomi says to them, stay in this place because I have no more sons to give to you. But Opa kisses and she leaves. But Ruth clings to Naomi and she enters into a covenant with Naomi. That's called bone to bone. In that joint, certain things get activated in a woman that was not supposed to even be in the lineage. This was a foreigner. This was a stranger. You were once a stranger and a foreigner because you are a Gentile. But now you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. Say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah. Simply because of Christ. And because you are connected to Christ, you are joined to Christ, you are one with Christ, you now have a lineage. Yeah. You now have something that you can say that you have, a heir, you have become a heir to what God has done. You have an inheritance in Christ. She had nothing. She didn't even know the ways of Judah, uh, of uh, Israel. She did not understand the law. She knew nothing. But she connected herself to a Naomi. She connected herself to someone that would give momentum to her life. She connected herself, and by doing that, she said something in Ruth 1 verse 16. She said, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. For wherever you go, I will go. You see, in a covenant, there are certain features. Listen, this is a very broad subject. I am just throwing it out. Is that okay? Because you're sleeping, I'm just trying to keep you awake. <laughs> bone to bone. There's a features of the covenant. The first feature is... There's a pursuing in the relationship. Where you go, I will go. The pursuit is left on the one that is wanting to connect. And here Ruth realizes that if she's ever going to have something to pass down in her generation, she needs to connect. And she said to Naomi, I will not leave you I want to be with you and treat me not to leave you or turn back from following you. And she pledges to follow her. She does not demand that Naomi runs after her. She runs after Naomi. Elisha runs after Elijah. Timothy follows Paul. The disciples followed Jesus. This is pursuit. Everyone say pursuit. When you discover your joint that you need to be connected to. The, the demand is upon the son to pursue. Say amen. amen. Now, lots of people in the context of the wineskin of a father-son relationship want sentimentality. They want emotion. They want someone to phone them on their birthdays. They want cakes and flowers. They want lots of stuff. I know a church that gives a cake to every person in the church on their birthday. And some of the pastors, the only ministry they know is to deliver cakes. <laughs> I have another word to use, but uh, that's not available for live streaming. <laughs> but if you see me privately, I'll tell you what it is. But you're going to know something. That the pursuit of the joint is left to the sun. That wants to connect, that, wants, that realizes, listen, I need a bone-to-bone -bone connection, so I must do the following. I must do the running after. The doctor never visits you at home and asks you if you are sick. 
<laughs> In your journey, you've got to know there's a joint for you. And when you find it, pursue it. Run after it. Pursue it with all your might. Go for it. Tell someone, go for it. Why? In that bone-to-bone -bone connection, one day you're going to own a piece of land and one day you're going to be in the lineage and Christ is going to be born through you. Now, she did not know the end of what it was going to be like because in the end, the woman said to her, you are worth to Naomi more than seven sons. Is that right? Yeah. This is about sonship. Yeah. But she had to find the joint and connect. Because in that bone-to-bone -bone connection, there's a supply that will give momentum to your life that shifts you from harvest to harvest. Yeah. From the wheat harvest, she shifted to the barley harvest. From one ephah of flour, she shifted to seven ephahs of flour. There are continual shifts that are taking place in her life. From just a foreigner, she shifted into sonship. We can talk about all the shifts that took place, but it takes place because of the initiation of the covenant with its features, which is the pursuing of a relationship. Now, in the kingdom of God, you got to know you can't join everyone. <laughs> Say amen. You can't join everyone because we are builders. As builders in the kingdom, you've got to know who you are joined to to build. The relationship between these joints is about building. So not everyone you join to will be able to build what the Lord is asking you to build. But you've got to find the joint that you know you have to be connected to to build in the kingdom. So don't just come together as bones, which looks great, but make sure that you have bone-to-bone -bone connections. The features of the covenant is also an abiding relationship, that where you lodge, I will lodge. That means I will stay with you. The abiding relationship is one of dwelling and marriage. It is one that is of covenant, that's one of staying, no matter what. You lodge in the relationship. I'm just going to go through a few things. The relationship is also that your people will be my people. That's relational ownership. That means whatever you are connected to, I am connected to. I am part of that. That the people that are within your sphere of influence and that are connected to you, I realize that they are my people. Your people will be my people. The relational, there's also the divine ownership. Your God will be my God. Now, in the book of Philippians, Paul says to the Philippian church, you are partakers of God's grace in me. And uh, later on, he said, no church shared with me except the Philippian church. That when I had needs, you shared with me. So how did they partake? They became shareholders. Everyone say shareholder. So if you wanted to partake of the grace, you had to be a shareholder. And the shareholder was in the form of giving and receiving. So they shared in the grace that was in Paul through the form of giving and receiving. In that context, he says, my God shall supply. Now let me say to you, you don't know God like the way Paul knew God. Okay, this side you're a bit proud. Let me try this side. When he says, my God, he's not taking ownership of God. He's talking about the relationship that he had with God. Okay? The access he had to God in terms of mysteries, decoding deep things, bringing out secret things, going through the prison, being beaten 39 times, having a viper on his hand, and being shaken it off. That's my God. Don't try and do what Paul was doing because you didn't know him the way he knew. He didn't know, you didn't know God the way he knew God. But you could access it. <laughs> you could access the way he knew God. That's why when you're reading the scriptures in terms of Paul's epistles, there are many times he uses the word us, he uses the word we, and he uses the word you. 
So when he says, the weapons of our warfare, it's not the war- weapons of warfare for a believer. It's the weapons of warfare in the apostolic context of someone who has the grace of an apostle upon his life. His weapons of warfare is apostolic. That's not a believer's weapon. Don't go and try and fight demons that he was fighting. You'll get assassinated. So oftentimes he would say we, our, us, and he would say you. So when he's saying we, it doesn't include all of us. (laughs) It includes him and Peter and, and Timothy. And he says we as apostles, you as saints. We went through certain things, but you benefited. So when he says, my God, he's giving you access to the way God allowed him to know him. And you became a shareholder of that God. So same God, but he knows him differently from you. Now, in the context of a joint, your father knows God different from the way you know him. But the joint gives you access to the way he knows him. This is where you get access to grace. Through the word that is released through the mouth of one that is designated in the joint to you for you to be connected. There are things that I will never receive revelation upon because God has already given him to my father, Dr. Segi. So I study it because he has access in a way that I may never have access. It takes humility to know that. It takes humbleness to know that. Are we all together? When she says, my God, you've got to understand this is about divine ownership. That I want to know God the way you know him. And I will receive that right because of my joint. So oftentimes, The way we want to know God, we are too proud just to make the joint to know Him in that way. So we choose to study from afar, but not make the covenant. Say amen. Your God will be my God. Now, this relationship of a joint is lifelong. I'll tell you why. Where you die, I will die. And there we will be buried. We don't suddenly take the knee joint and connect it to the elbow because we got nothing to do. The joint stays. Amen? Where you die, I will die. This kind of relationships are bone to bone. Only at that point does it begin to receive sinew and flesh. Something starts to get seen. Something starts to receive image. Something starts to receive meat. Something starts to receive form and shape. We have the internal structure, but Outside, no one can see anything. But at that moment, when there's bone-to-bone connections, deep covenantal relationships, we start forming something in the spirit that becomes evident to all. Amen? But it requires us to follow in the features of a covenant. While you have the features of the covenant where you say, where you, where lifelong relationship, divine ownership, relational ownership, abiding relationship, and also pursuing of the relationship, know that in the covenant there will be instructions. Yeah. What are the instructions? Wash yourself. Dress yourself. Anoint yourself. Present yourself. Hello? Yeah. The, the intent of the joint is to make you lie down before Boaz. Some of you didn't get that. It is what what Tamu alluded to. That the whole intent of the relationship in terms of fathers and sons is to make you connect to the one who is the true. 
Boaz is the redeemer. He is the representation of Christ the redeemer. And the relationship between Naomi and Ruth was only for her to go and prostrate and lie herself before Christ the redeemer. So the father mustn't wash you. You wash yourself by what he teaches you. You anoint yourself. That's a powerful word. It's, it's to rub yourself. You have to dress yourself. The problem is we are too lazy to do that stuff. It's called personal responsibility. In every joint, there's a rela- there's a re- the relationship requires personal responsibility. And the responsibility comes because you follow the instructions. Say amen. Many times Paul would command his sons, instruct his sons, write epistles to churches with clear instructions in them, with clear commands in them. When there's a joint, it must follow instructions. And when you follow instructions, momentum comes. Say amen. Amen. Something begins to take place. Something begins to accelerate. Something begins to find momentum and flow quicker and quicker and quicker. So in your journey, you need a bone. You need a joint in your life. This this subject is so so important. It's so important. Because we find many casualties in life Because they have no joints. They're not connected to anything. They're not connected to anyone. And they don't know how to remain connected. Lots of people connect uh, because they see things, but they don't connect in the spirit with something. They don't connect because of the spiritual dynamic. Let me say this, uh, something that I was going to mention at a later stage. Every relationship, even as, as Randolph mentioned, will be tested. And your sonship relationship will go through three tests. I'll just mention it. It will go through the flood test. It will go through the wind test. It will go through the rain test. To test what your house is built upon. And if you build upon the rock, and the rock is Christ, Christ is the Son of God, when you build your life upon the principle of sonship, it will face these, these tests. The word test is the test of <clears throat> the, the, uh, the flood, which is the word of God. The wind test is the test of the spirit. The rain test is the test of blessings. When you have a connection in the spirit, one of the things that will happen is that that that's those relationships have benefits. And that benefit is, one of it is God begins to bless you. But you don't realize it's your test. You see, anything you build gets tested. Noah built an ark, flood test. Moses built a tabernacle in the midst of the wilderness. It was a wind test. Because in the wilderness, the winds were, were quite strong. And he had to build it right so that the tabernacle could stand. Solomon built an edifice which was called the temple. And it was a test of his prosperity. But later on you know that he failed because he used his prosperity to start building idols. So that all the women that he brought into into Jerusalem. He had to build different altars for them so that they could worship their gods. And he used his prosperity to do that. Every building you build, it will be tested. So even when you begin to have the joint, the connection that you make, know that it will be tested. Right now in my own impression, in my heart, the spirit of sonship, particularly in the context of a father-son wineskin, is testing the maturity of your wine. Is it of your spirit? Or is it just something that you heard that you needed to do? But now it's under serious pressure. To test, are you really a son in the spirit? Because you can get grace in many ways. You get grace by benediction, the pronouncement of something. You get grace because we lay hands on you. You get grace because of proximity. You stay near. You stay in the sight of. 
you also get grace because your heart is connected. You see, the first three I mentioned is external. But the last one I mentioned is internal. It's deeply inside of the heart. And it's a test of your, of the spirit of sonship to see whether you are bone to bone. When that comes under pressure, the flood test, the wind test, the rain test starts to come. Then we will know whether it's wood, stubble or hay or whether it's, whether it's of silver, gold and precious stones. In my own estimation right now, the spirit of sonship is being tested because it's a foundational doctrine of the season. And whatever we release, the word tests us. I'll just throw this in and it's something I'll elaborate maybe tomorrow. One of the tests that you would face in your journey is what Randolph mentioned, is the test of the relationships with your brothers. You see, for Jacob to become Israel, he had to pass the brother test. He had to prevail through that. When Joseph was in Egypt and he came into governorship and he had power and the fulfillment of what of the dreams that he saw had come to pass, it was tested when his brothers appeared before him. Because he had the power to kill all of them. <clears throat> one word from his mouth and he would have slain everyone. And no one would have blinked an eye. The test of his true sonship came up when his brothers stood before him. Hello? Yeah. Know that as you make bone to bone connections, it will be tested. So I pray this, this afternoon, I know I have three minutes more, but I don't want to get into another point. I pray that as bones, as we've gone through hearing the sound, went through the rattling, and I know that some of you that have, that have perceived the sound have lost a lot in your journey. You lost relationships. I know some people that have lost buildings. They have lost millions of rands. They lost a lot going through the rattling. But make sure you find that bone-to-bone -bone connection. Pursue it. Run after it. Amen? Let it be something that will give momentum into your life. <laughs>